Thousands of fans of Grammy-nominated rapper and community activist Nipsey Hussle are in a state of shock today. They are mourning the hip-hop star's ultimately and violent death. This is Ermes Joseph Ashkadam, better known to the world as Nipsey Hussle, a Grammy-nominated rap artist. But Nipsey's impact extended far beyond his music. He was a father and an inspiration within his community, referred to as Neighborhood Nip. Crenshaw even regarded to him as a philanthropist and a catalyst for change and a fierce advocate against the plague of gun violence. Yet beneath the surface of his journey, Nipsey harbored a past. He was connected to the notorious Rolling Sixties Crips, a connection that would ultimately bring him face to face with Eric Holder. And it was on that fateful day, March 31st, 2019, when Eric took the life of Nipsey Hussle, leaving a void that could never be filled. But why did Eric commit such a heinous act? And where does he find himself now as the world seeks justice for the loss of Nipsey? This is the case of Nipsey Hussle. Hermes Joseph Ashkadam was born on August 15th, 1985 in South LA's Crenshaw District to do it Ashkadam and Angelique Smith. At a young age, his parents separated, but he still had the privilege of growing up with both his mother and his father as they continued to live in the same neighborhood. Now his family consisted of himself, his younger sister, Samantha, and his older brother who he referred to as Black Sam. Now from a young age of six, Hermes was immersed in hip hop, even memorizing songs from his favorite rap group, Criss Cross. Now during that time, many young artists were signing record deals and gaining popularity. Hermes developed a single goal, to create music and secure a record deal. And now even as a child, he began writing rhymes, anticipating that he too would achieve greatness in music. However, when this didn't happen, he diverted his energy to a different way of life and making money. Throughout his upbringing, Ermi's older brother Sam had a significant influence on him. As Ermi's entered his teenage years, he looked up to Sam and saw that making money came easy to him. Now witnessing Sam's hustle and tenacity only motivated Ermi's to pursue his own financial success. In the sixth grade, he got his first job shining shoes at a nearby shop in Slauson. Now it's said that on some days he earned nearly a hundred dollars. That's a lot of money for somebody in the sixth grade, especially at that time. Damn, the sixth grade. I remember my first job was, I believe, in grade eight, and I would deliver newspapers to businesses. It was definitely an interesting time. I remember saving up enough to get my first basketball jersey doing that. It was awesome. I'll always remember that. Now, despite the temptation to spend it all, he also recognized the importance of saving and managing his finances, which is really crazy for somebody his age. But his desire to only accumulate more money grew stronger throughout the years. Now this led him to sell candy and mow lawns on the side. However, deep down, his true passion was always music. Now among his neighbors, Hermes had a friend who owned a computer and he was the only person in the neighborhood who owned one. Now determined to pursue his musical aspirations, Hermes decided to put his savings into buying his first microphone. And at a mere 11 years old, he recorded his very first song over a Snoop Dogg instrumental. And recognizing his son's passion, Ermi's mother, Angelique, enrolled him in a program that exposed children to music studios and provided lessons on using their equipment. Now, consequently, Ermi's gradually honed his skills in music engineering and beat production. His beats even began to gain recognition in his neighborhood and people were approaching him for production and beats. But apart from the microphone and despite his other business endeavors, Hermes just couldn't afford to purchase all the music equipment that he needed. Now, for those of you who don't know, before USB microphones were a thing, recording equipment was super 
expensive. You needed a fast computer, you needed a microphone, you needed an interface, you needed acoustic treatment for your room. Everything is so dang expensive. And believe me, I have a background in audio engineering and that's how I know this. Now, consequently, because of this, he began exploring other avenues to generate money. And it was during this period that he got involved with the gang culture. At this point, Ermes became part of the Rolling 60s Crips, the dominant gang in the Crenshaw area. Now, this affiliation exposed him to a world of drug dealing, fights, and overall gang violence. However, deep down inside, he held on to a dream of something greater than just gangs, knowing that this lifestyle wouldn't be his path forever. Meanwhile, the money he had earned allowed him to invest in himself, a luxury he had never experienced before. And as a result, he made the difficult decision to drop out of high school in his sophomore year, believing that there was a promising future and opportunity in music for him. And despite being able to finish high school, it wasn't his main focus at the time. Naturally, his mother didn't take this well. She even went as far as changing the locks in the house and kicking him out altogether. He would end up finding a place near his grandmother's home, but surprisingly, this only fueled his determination. Being unsupervised allowed him to spend endless hours on the block, fully immersed in the street culture. It was like a combination of, you know what I'm saying, just being out of age. I left my house kind of early. How old? When I was probably like 14. Okay, so you were on your own at 14 years old? Yeah, I was out of my mom's house, you know what I'm saying? I went to live with my granny when I was 14 and um you know I just was was uh um, taking care of myself early on and um you know I was I was doing things to try to get money so I could support myself I always wanted to do music that was my first passion before anything this only solidified his pursuit for a music career and around the age of 15 he began viewing music as a way out of the streets altogether initially he was known as concept and eventually formed a rap group with one of his friends Kid Inc. Their group became known as Stranded Minds, and through hard work, they managed to acquire the necessary recording equipment to set up their own makeshift recording studio. It's funny, I've, I've lived this too. <laughs> I used to make music, and I remember getting my first microphone and setting it up in a closet. Now, initially, they set up this makeshift recording studio at their friend Rimpaw's house, but this only marked the beginning of the grind. And one day in the middle of a recording session, he realized he needed a name that truly represented who he was. And a friend named Baby Gooch offered to come up with something that was suitable for him and something that reflected who he had become. And when they met up a few days later, he realized that Hermes had a really easy time generating money effortlessly. And because of this, he suggested the name Nipsey Hustle. Now, the name drew inspiration from Nipsey Russell, who was a famous, renowned poet and comedian from the 1950s, with a slight alteration to the name to better suit Hermes. But in the midst of all this, Nipsey remained deeply invested in the street life, still involved in gang activities, and his reputation began to spread. And in 2003, he released his first mixtape titled the middleman, which he hustled by selling out of the trunk out of his car in the neighborhood. He also performed at small gatherings within his community, and it was during this time that the shift started to occur in his mindset. At the age of 18, Nipsey's family embarked on a three-month journey back to his father's homeland, and witnessing the living conditions there opened his eyes to the blessings he actually had. And upon returning, he found out that his life on the streets was becoming increasingly complicated. You see, he had been caught up in a shootout and the incident, unfortunately, was captured on camera. Now, while Nipsey remained unidentified, a few of his close friends found themselves facing long sentences. Now, witnessing this, Nipsey came to realize that the path he was on would likely lead him to death or jail. Now, this moment became the catalyst that would change his life forever. Something had to change. So he decided to sell his white Lincoln to a friend and together with his brother, they pooled their resources to build their own music studio. Nipsey knew it was time to go all in in investing in his music and himself. 
and in 2005, he filed the necessary paperwork to establish his own record label, Slauson Boys. This only meant that he would be able to produce and record music at a faster pace. And in December 2005, he released his first mixtape, The Slauson Boys Volume 1. Now determined to spread his music, he handed to print as many copies as he possibly could and hand them out everywhere. His pitch was even, if it's whack, you could throw it out the window. And surprisingly, many people took him up on the offer and started listening to his music. Now as Nipsey's local buzz began to take shape, it remained relatively small. However, a friend named Big U recognized his hard work and decided to become his manager. Now this later on became a big deal because Big U had an extensive network. Now in that network was Steve LaBelle, who happened to listen to the Slauson Boy mixtape. And yes, he instantly fell in love with it. And because of this, he also wanted to be Nipsey Hussle's manager. And because of this, Nipsey would go on to have two managers who wholeheartedly supported his vision. And under their guidance, Nipsey got his first taste of the mainstream in 2006 when he was featured on a song for Tupac's album, Pac's life. However, despite their positive momentum, setbacks found their ways back into Nipsey's life. In November of that year, his brother's house was raided by the police. And as a result, all their recording equipment was confiscated. And Nipsey himself faced charges related to a shotgun that they had actually found. Now the setback forced Nipsey back onto the streets to earn more money just for legal representation. However, fortunately, he had already a substantial collection of previously recorded music, which he basically compiled into a demo tape. And while hanging out on the block one day, Nipsey ran into the rapper, The Game, and seizing the opportunity that he had in front of him, he decided to hand him a demo tape. And to his surprise, The Game called him later that night, expressing his interest in working with him. And The Game wasn't the only one who recognized that Nipsey was special. In fact, a film director that same year decided to reach out to Nipsey and cast him in the Bone Thugs and Harmony movie. Now, while on the movie set, Nipsey crossed paths with Johnny Snipes, who ran his own record label under Sony and Epic Records. At the time, Johnny Snipes was the only person willing to take a chance on Nipsey due to his affiliation with gangs. Once again, trouble managed to find its way into Nipsey's life. He attended a party where an underage girl falsely accused him of engaging in sex with her. But fortunately for him and the financial resources that he had acquired due to his record deal, he was able to hire a skilled lawyer and successfully defeat the charges. And with this now behind him, it was finally time for Nipsey to elevate his music career. He was now gaining attention for a track that he had released titled Bullets Ain't Got No Name, which was produced by Kid Ink, which also became the title of his first mixtape under the label, which dropped in April of 2008. This mixtape served as his true entry point into the music industry. He even was able to collaborate on songs with The Game and Snoop Dogg. At this point, Nipsey and his brother eventually secured a lease for a store, which would later become the original Marathon Clothing Store. And throughout the entirety of 2009, Nipsey continued to create music and his popularity grew rapidly. But despite his collaborations with The Game, Snoop Dogg, and even Drake, he was still struggling to break into the mainstream. At this point, Epic Records was facing budget cuts, but instead of dropping Nipsey Hussle altogether, they offered him his own label imprint, giving a rise to all money in records. Now, this breakthrough led Nipsey to being featured on the coveted 2010 XXL freshman list alongside notable artists such as J-Rock, Big Sean, and J. Cole. And although his name was generating recognition, his music was not generating any sales. And it's safe to say that the label was let down. But in response to this, Nipsey Hussle decided to remain fully independent and take matters into his own hands. And wasting no time, Nipsey decided to drop two more mixtapes and forge his own path and take control over his career. And he was finally getting the momentum that he felt he deserved. But their moment of celebration 
didn't last for long, as Nipsey and four others found themselves in custody after an altercation with the police. And during the incident, the police actually fired shots at Black Sam. Now, all five individuals were arrested and Black Sam ended up being sentenced to five years, resulting in the temporary loss of the clothing store. However, Nipsey remained determined to make moves on the outside, and he released his highly successful mixtape, The Marathon Continues. And one thing that set Nipsey aside from every other artist was his business-minded approach to everything he did in the music industry. And despite his flourishing career at this point in music, he ended up opening many businesses in his neighborhood. This included a fat burger restaurant, a cell phone shop, and a hair salon. Now he applied his same business mindset that he had learned from owning all these businesses to his music. And in 2013, he made hip hop history. Nipsey announced the release of his latest mixtape, Crenshaw. And in truly unique fashion, he decided to charge $100 for every copy. And he would only produce a thousand mixtapes. Now, obviously he received a lot of backlash for this. Now he was determined to prove everybody wrong. And just one month later, he opened up a pop-up shop in Los Angeles to sell his mixtape. And he even sold copies to Jay-Z who purchased a hundred copies himself. And remarkably, this was his first project to break into the Billboard 100 charts, which peaked at number 63. In 2017, Nipsey expanded his business ventures by opening more stores, including a seafood market, the World on Wheels roller rink, and officially reopening his clothing store. However, he had an even bigger surprise in store. After almost 15 years since his first mixtape, he finally announced his debut album, Victory Lap. Now, Victory Lap would reach number four on the Billboard charts. It sold an impressive 53,000 copies in its first week alone and earned him his first Grammy nomination. Additionally, two singles from the album achieved gold certification, which earned Nipsey's first plaques to proudly ever display on his wall. Nipsey was finally receiving recognition, but not just in Los Angeles, but all across the United States and made a significant move by purchasing the entire plaza where the Marathon store was located. Now, this was a monumental achievement, not just for him, but his entire city. He even recalled hustling in front of the plaza way before he even owned it. Now, everything in Nipsey's life was on the up and up. It was on a full upswing, but everything took a devastating turn on March 31st, 2019. He woke up that day with the intention of helping a friend who had just been released from prison, providing him with some free clothes and some money at that. Nipsey spent time hanging out in front of his store, taking pictures with fans, just like any other normal day. And at 2.52 p.m., he posted a tweet stating, having strong enemies is a blessing, unknowingly making it his final message on social media. And tragically, just moments later, an individual approached Nipsey, taking shots at him. Now, Nipsey sustained gunshot wounds to his leg, stomach, his back, and his head before the assailant fled the scene. And it was unthinkable for so many people to accept that somebody would gun down Nipsey. I mean, this was somebody that was fighting for their city to make changes and fighting against gun violence, even putting up basketball courts for kids to play in all for his life to just be tragically taken away. On March 31st, 2019, Nipsey Hussle made his way to the Marathon Clothing Store, situated on the intersection of Slauson and Crenshaw. He parked his black car without any security. You see, Nipsey was always one of these down-to-earth guys, and he always felt like when he was in Crenshaw, he was just amongst his people. There was nothing to fear. Now, Nipsey greeted everyone in the parking lot, signing autographs and taking pictures with fans. And coincidentally, at the same time, a man by the name of Eric Holder was on a collision course with Nipsey Hussle. Eric Holder was known in the industry as Fly Mac or Shitty Cuz on the street. And he had a previous connection to Nipsey as he was previously signed to Nipsey's label. However, he was removed from the gang due to allegations of snitching. Now, while Nipsey was at his store, Eric Holder was accompanied by a female companion, Brianita Nicholson, who was 35 years old at the time. And unbeknownst to her, the man that she allowed into her life 
had a sinister plan to end Nipsey's life. Now, Bri and Nita simply thought they were out for a drive to pick up some fast food. And as they approached the mall, she realized that Holder had a black semi-automatic gun and his revolver on him. Now, he claimed that this was simply just for protection. CCTV footage captured her 2016 white Chevy Cruze pulling into the parking lot next to Nipsey and his two friends, Herman Douglas, also known as Cowboy, and Evan McKenzie, also known as Rimpaw. And as the car reached the corner, Nipsey asked Rimpaw, hey, is that shitty? Brianita later testified that she had made a comment to Eric Holder saying that Nipsey was so fine. And yes, it is possible that this comment alone could have added fuel to the fire and made Eric mad enough to well, ultimately do what he did. It's also worth noting that Nipsey and Holder had just gotten into an altercation the week prior. Now, this is only according to an interview, I believe, with WAC 100 that was done by Vlad TV, if I'm not mistaken. Wait, is this, say it again, I missed what you said. Them same two dudes who just had a fight a week prior? The same two dudes? Yeah. Talking about Cowboy? Shitty and Nipsey. Shitty cuz and Nipsey Hustle got into a fight? They had a fight a week prior to that. I, I never heard that. Yeah, it's a fact. I'm not saying it's, it's not true. I just yeah. said I never heard that. Okay. So you're saying that there's already a bad situation? Yeah. No How does someone like a shitty cuz, though, get into a fight with Nipsey considering who Nipsey is and considering who shitty cuz is? See, that, that's the thing. What you guys, you talk about Nipsey the Rapper, right? Yeah. I'm um, Crenshaw Slauson. You know who Nipsey is? Rolling 60s. That's it. Yeah. Holder went on about his usual routine, or at least it seemed that way. He got out of the car shirtless and entered the Master Burger. However, once his order was placed, he immediately came back outside and adverted his attention to Nipsey. And as Holder approached him, he began shaking everybody's hands, including Nipsey's. Brianita later mentioned that she could hardly make out the conversation and that they had just touched on the topic of snitching between Nipsey and Holder. Brianita even noticed that Nipsey was calm the entire time, that there was no animosity, at least from Nipsey's side. Holder's emotions started to escalate and he became visibly agitated. Cowboy, one of Nipsey's close friends who was present at the time, explained that Nipsey was informing Holder about rumors that were circulating about Holder snitching. And just so you know, snitching in the gang world is completely unaccepted. You're either kicked off the gang or worse, you can be murdered for it. Now, because Nipsey already had some rapport with Holder, it seemed like he was just simply trying to give him a heads up that he needed to, I guess, make it right that he had these allegations flying around that he had possibly snitched. According to Cowboy, Nipsey said, I haven't seen the paperwork myself, but you need to take care of that. It was as if Nipsey still had some care for Holder, even though these rumors were flying around. At this point, Nipsey turned to Brianita and offered to take a photo with her as he saw her as a fan. But little did he know that this would be the last picture he would ever take. A short while later, Holder went back into Masterburger to pick up his food. And when he returned to the vehicle, he told Brianita to drive around the back. Now Holder had pulled out his weapon, but as she questioned him, he simply dismissed it and laughed it off and told her to drive to the back and park. Now Brianita testified that she had no idea of what Holder was up to. Now, Brianita's part in all of this has been up for debate since this incident happened. Some people feel that she very much was in on the plan to end Nipsey's life. At this point, Holder got out of the vehicle and made his way through the alley back to the mall where Nipsey was standing. And as Nipsey was engaged in a conversation with his friends, he unleashed a hail of gunfire. Using both his 40 caliber semi-automatic weapon and his revolver, he ended up taking approximately 10 shots at Nipsey. And all of it was captured on camera. Now he ended up fleeing the scene right away, only to return to make sure that the job was finished. And before fleeing through the alleyway, Holder kicked Nipsey in the skull. Holder was even heard yelling at Nipsey's body, saying, you're through. Now Nipsey laid on the ground fighting for his life alongside two of his friends who were fortunately less injured during the attack. And his friends tried to put pressure on his wounds, trying to make sure that they can keep him alive as the paramedics got there. Now paramedics swiftly got there only to find Nipsey on the floor bleeding out. Now they desperately tried to resuscitate him as they were putting him on the gurney to get him in the ambulance. He was rushed to the emergency room, but despite their best efforts and attempts, Nipsey tragically lost his life. He succumbed to his injuries upon arrival at the hospital. 
Nipsey had endured multiple gunshot wounds to his head, chest, abdomen, and foot. And these bullets reportedly severed his spine and punctured his lungs, causing the fatal damage. Now, as Nipsey was fighting for his life, Holder made an escape and he navigated through various alleyways and it was all caught on surveillance footage. Now, still holding both murder weapons, he entered the car. Brianita had asked him at that point what he had done. Holder would go on to threaten her and say that he would slap her if she just didn't drive. That evening, Brianita made the decision to let Holder stay at her house for one night. She booked him a hotel wanting to distance herself from the situation and from him. And she claimed that she had no idea of any connection that he had to Nipsey's death. But now that Holder's life was in danger and fear of retaliation, she just wanted nothing to do with him. Everyone around him, including his family, became targets of, well, revenge. And under the immense pressure of what his brother had done, Holder's brother tragically took his own life, and it was a heartbreaking turn of events. Now, from what I have understood is that when you live somewhere like Crenshaw or Compton, it's hard to understand the world outside of your small neighborhood. If you think about it, some people in those areas live in poverty. They don't have much to themselves, and it's it's easy to say, hey, I would just get up and move, right? And unfortunately, for somebody living in that circumstance, you might not have the money to just get up and move and put a deposit on a new apartment or pay the rent at a new apartment or find a new job because you're lucky enough to have the one that you might have if you have one at all. And unfortunately, it seems like Holder's brother maybe just felt like he had no escape from the situation. Now, on April 2nd, officers received a tip regarding Holder's whereabouts. It appeared that he was hiding in the Bellflower area, and they swiftly tracked him down and successfully apprehended him. Now he would have to face a multitude of charges, including murder, two attempted murders, possession of a firearm as a felon, assault, and assault with a firearm. Wow, this list is crazy. Now, Holder's legal team attempted to spin the situation as a crime of passion, suggesting that he never had the intention of taking Nipsey's life and that they had gotten into an argument and it happened in the heat of the moment and he was provoked by the label of being called a snitch. However, before he could learn his fate through the legal system, prisoners took matters into their own hands and apparently the Mexican gangs mercilessly attacked Holder in his holding cell subjecting him to a brutal beating that, well, rendered him unconscious, and there's pictures of it online. They even used a razor blade to cut him open, resulting in a swollen eye that required some staples. Now, despite the circumstances and the revenge that he faced, Holder was ultimately convicted of first-degree murder and a sentence of 60 years to life in prison. This story just makes me so angry. I mean, this is a prime example of ruining not just only your life, but multiple lives over something so insignificant. I mean, we're really talking about name calling, which Nipsey didn't even do. He just asked him about it and told him to take care of the situation, which is which is probably good advice if you're living in that environment or part of a gang. And it seems like Nipsey just had his best intentions when it came to Holder. But ultimately it seems like Eric felt like he was being called out. And look what ended up happening. And no matter how long Holder serves a sentence, we'll never change any of that. Anyways, that's it for me today. I want to encourage you to hit the subscribe button if you want to support the channel. It's free and it goes a long way to really helping me out. So until next time, I hope you stay safe and I will see you when the lights go out.